there. We don't have that. Even though we knew that we had the body of Jesse Hell, I think the critical thing at that time was where was Wendy? Marion County, Florida investigators have a double mystery on their hands. Who bludgeoned 19-year-old Jesse Howell to death, then left his body beside a railway track? And what has become of his 16-year-old girlfriend, Wendy? We need to know, is she okay? That's the critical question. Police comb the surrounding area, but find no sign of Wendy or any clues as to the identity of Jesse's killer. It's difficult enough for the Jesse's family to deal with this situation, but it's doubly difficult because Wendy's family doesn't know what happened. Nor do investigators. Did a suspect kill Jesse to get Wendy? Did Wendy and Jesse have an out and Wendy somehow hurt Jesse? She may have just fled the scene or left the area. Whether she was on her own, we don't know. She and Jesse were in love with each other. They were committed to each other. And so if she was with someone else, it seemed to me by all things that I had learned that this would be against her will. News of the young man's tragic fate quickly makes its way to the couple's friends. I, I remember hearing the phone ring, my sister talking on the phone, and then she, she, hung, up, she hung off the phone and came downstairs and she told me to sit down and I was like, oh no, you know, something bad happened. And my, then she started crying, you know, she, and all she had to say was, you know, his name. She couldn't even finish the sentence and I knew right away. And Justin's grief is compounded by haunting guilt. There were things I could have done. What if I could have, you know, talked him out of it? What if I, you know, what if I had stopped him from going? I could have saved him, you know? Now investigators are determined to find Jesse's girlfriend. Police and volunteers paper the southeastern United States with posters and distribute flyers along the Florida to Illinois route. We also try to do it through the truckers network because there are a lot of truckers there and they see a lot of things. You know, they're a great avenue of information for you. And police return to the tracks. Might a homeless rail rider have seen something that could help solve the case? Investigators enlist the help of the railway authorities. There's a very well-defined railroad police network in the United States. They have a reputation of being very well in tune with the homeless population. And they start talking to some of the transient people that live there among the tracks in what they call their hobo camps. In the meantime, Florida and Illinois police investigate every sighting of a young woman matching Wendy's description. One of the sightings was that she was living in an abandoned house that one of her old friends had been living in, so we did a search of this vacant house. There were a lot of rumors flying around. You know, the, the, uh, she's here, she's there. Somebody said she'd been seen at a Marilyn Manson concert. People said, oh, I got a phone call from her. And there were phone calls out in Nevada, out in Colorado that we had to follow up on. Those were all found to be uh, false leads. It was starting to get frustrating as the case dwindled on and information was not coming in. And with a killer on the loose, the Marion County community is growing frustrated too. When you have an unsolved homicide, then the people that live in that area always wonder, is there someone among us? You know, who did this and how could it happen in our area? Then on June 4th, two and a half months after Jesse's body was found, Wendy's parents receive a phone call that promises an end to the parents' harrowing nightmare. The phone rang, and Wendy's father answered the phone. The girl was crying. I said she wanted to come home. She's really sorry. I love you. She tells the father she's in Illinois, two hours south of Woodstock in the town of Kankakee. She was at a gas station. She's using a pay phone. He asked her, where's this gas station? She said she didn't know where the gas station's located. He asked her if there was a phone number on the payphone. She said, there's no phone number on this payphone. Then the phone call ended. Although investigators aren't certain the caller was Wendy, they can't afford to take any chances. If she had been held captive, she could have gotten loose, or she may have had that one opportunity to make that phone call. Let's get to her right away. And there is more riding on her rescue. 
Now maybe we have Wendy as a witness to Jesse's death and we'll be able to assist Marion County on getting the homicide resolved. But first, they need to find out where that phone call was made. Then... Go to that point, see if anybody actually saw a girl fitting Wendy's description there. The next morning, I made arrangements to go down to Kankakee to start searching the gas stations for any witnesses or evidence that she was down there. When Rosenquist finds no one who remembers seeing a girl matching Wendy's description, he begins a systematic search of the town's gas station payphones, looking for ones with no posted number. All of them had the phone number prominently displayed right above the keypad on the telephone, um, except for one. Was this the location from which Wendy made her frantic call? After searching for months, investigators may be close to finding the 16-year-old girlfriend of murdered teenager Jesse Howell. I hope it's true. I really hope it's true. I hope that she's been out there. Her parents received a frantic phone call from a young girl they believe is their daughter, Wendy. Now police have tracked down surveillance video from a gas station where they think the call was made. I started viewing the video. I observed a female subject that physically resembled Wendy. I wasn't going to say 100% that it was her, but it was right at the time frame that the phone calls being made. They show the tape to Wendy's parents. So when Wendy's mom said it was definitely her and there was other family members thinking it was her, we had to treat it as a bona fide sighting. It means we've got another lead that we've got to find Wendy, that the possibility of her being alive is great. The hopes were really high at that point. This would be wonderful if somehow Wendy had made it back to her home state. And so the feelings at that point were guarded optimism. As a result of this video, we subpoenaed the phone records of Wendy's parents to make sure that this phone call was made from that gas station. When investigators receive the information five days later, their hopes are dashed. It indicated that the phone calls made to Wendy's parents did not come from that phone at the gas station where we had retrieved the video. Uh, it turned out it came from a different gas station and it had the flyers that we had posted. Desperate for news of their daughter, Wendy's parents had added their home number to the posters. Keep in mind that Wendy's parents were extremely stressed through this whole ordeal. Uh, that sometimes can skew a person's view or actually uh, hearing a voice on the phone, things of that nature. Unfortunately, it seemed like this was a very cruel prank or joke being played on Wendy's family. Police believe it was someone pretending to be Wendy who had called the parents from one gas station. While across town, a girl resembling Wendy had coincidentally entered the gas station convenience store. Investigators are shocked by the callousness of the caller. How somebody could be so cruel to make a phone call to a family member, pretend that it's your daughter who's been missing for months. I can't fathom someone who would play a prank like that and get the parents' hopes up it, in, in my vision it's disgusting can imagine putting myself in that place saying that uh, I've got someone missing and all of a sudden they're calling they're crying help me and you have no earthly way of helping them you can't get to them you don't know where they're at uh, all of a sudden they're gone again and then your life is shattered one more time that's a cruel roller coaster ride as more months pass without any sign of Wendy, investigators grow increasingly disheartened. Our detectives would keep case files and case books. So the books were always in front of you with the, the name of the homicide victim on the spine. So you always had that in front of you somewhere. It's frustrating when you don't solve a case rapidly. And the colder a case may get, the harder it is to solve. It is generally up to you on how to deal with that frustration. Do you shrug and, and give up? Uh, I don't think we ever really give up. Jeff Owens 
almost became my best friend. I drove them crazy. I drove Patty Lumpkin crazy, I'm sure. I was constantly calling them, constantly calling the offices. We needed to know what was going on. We needed to know if Wendy had been found. My biggest fear for her at this point is that she is dead. And I think that's a possibility because more time goes by and you've not heard anything and you have no clues that are solid. We were hitting a brick wall at that point. A year passes with little progress. Hopes of finding Wendy are beginning to fade. Then, investigators receive a call from the railroad authorities with a very promising lead. Near the town of Jacksonville, we got word that one of the homeless guys mentions, I know a guy named One-Legged Bob who is traveling with a girl and could very well be responsible for the murder of her previous boyfriend. 16-year-old Wendy has been missing for more than a year, and the investigators who've been tirelessly searching for her have run out of leads. You always hope for the best, but as they say, you prepare for the worst. They return to the railway tracks, where they learn that a hobo with a criminal record and the nickname One-Legged Bob is rumored to have been involved in killing Jesse Howell and may know Wendy's whereabouts. This is an extremely important lead for us. We've got to find who One-Legged Bob is, and does he have a girl with him? But how to track an elusive hobo? We did a lot of research on him. We tried to determine what sort of past he had. One nigga Bob did have a criminal record. I think his traveling, his transient uh, life was something that would be a possibility for someone to be involved. Police once again enlist the help of the railway authorities. It was just a matter of weeks before they called me right back and said, Jeff, we found one legged Bob. Do you want to talk to him now? Owens quickly makes his way to Pensacola, Florida to talk to the potential killer. One-legged Bob was your typical, what you might consider a homeless person, kind of scruffy, hadn't shaved in a few days. And he had a prosthetic leg that helped him get around. So for someone who you might consider crippled, he was far from crippled. And well capable of the murder of Jesse Howell. I spent the next seven and a half hours interviewing him about what knowledge he had of this case, how involved he may or may not be. It was exhaustive. Have police finally found the person responsible for Wendy's disappearance and Jesse's murder? Throughout this lengthy interview, he didn't trip. He did not falter. And it's a series of those type of moments that a seasoned investigator will start to get the feeling and the confirmation that I'm dealing with the wrong guy. We really couldn't connect him to her. There was nothing we could do except release him. Investigators are deeply disappointed in their inability to solve either case, and they're not the only ones. For us, it was horrible. It was excruciating, but we knew where our son was. We knew what had happened and where he was, and they had absolutely no idea where their daughter was, and that's got to be horrifying. If I didn't know where one of my daughters was for years, didn't know if she was alive or not, 